Um, okay, everyone, I think we're going to start. So welcome to our session on why we need feminist investigative journalism. My name is Lara White. I'm a freelance journalist and I'm a producer from Belfast and currently the special projects editor of 5050, which is the gender and sexuality section of Open Democracy. My background is in commercial news, documentary and TV, and I joined 5050 last summer. Over the past year, myself and Clara Provost, our editor, started focusing more on investigations on 5050. And today on the panel, we're going to give you some examples of what we've been doing and also hearing from some of our allies and colleagues across open democracy. So because there's quite a few of us, I'm going to introduce people just before they talk. And everyone's going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we've allocated half an hour for questions, so we hope that you get involved then. So Claire Provo, not Provost actually, um, is an investigative reporter and the editor of 5050. She's Canadian, but she lives in Italy. And so Claire, we're gonna start by asking you to explain what we at 5050 mean when we talk about feminist investigative journalism. Great. Uh, thank you, Lara, and thank you to everyone for coming. This is really great. We're really excited to be here, really looking forward to the conversation after as well. Um, so I've been a journalist for about 10 years now, and I became particularly attracted to and interested in investigative reporting because of its promises, its very core promises to uncover and expose abuses of power, to reveal critical new information in the public interest. So Lara and I, when we, when we started working on 5050, we, we began asking ourselves, where, where are the investigative journalists challenging patriarchy, challenging structural violence against women, challenging intersecting forms of power and oppression? Now, of course, there are in some incredible journalists who are doing this work, um, including Rebecca, including um, all of the women on this panel. I, but they often do this thanklessly and with too few resources. And this is just not enough. It's just not acceptable. So we see feminist investigative journalism as serious investigative reporting about women's and LGBTI rights, but not only that. We want to produce important investigative stories in collaboration with other and with younger women and trans writers to also build their capacity and thus our collective capacity to investigate these issues. So it's not just about what we write, but also how we write and how we work. To give an example, one that's really close to our hearts, um, one of our core projects on 5050 these days is uh, an ongoing, in-depth, and an investigative series tracking the global backlash against sexual and reproductive rights. And the goal of this series, Tracking the Backlash, is to demystify this backlash by revealing how international networks of ultra-conservative and fundamentalist organizations are increasingly working together internationally to undermine these rights in law, in policy, in media, and other battlegrounds. So in countries where these rights are not currently respected or enshrined in national law, this backlash often focuses on stalling progress where these rights have existed on law books for years, even generations, this backlash instead aims at rolling back or undermining these rights. But unfortunately, when the media covers uh, these issues, when it does, um, off, too often it's th these issues are reported on um, through isolated individual cases or as completely nebulous megatrends, sort of this backlash that is out there but is not concrete, is neither here nor there, and the extent to which this backlash is actually a coordinated, organized movement with identifiable key players, strategies, funders, and very concrete impacts, this really demands very serious attention from investigative journalists. So we want to respond to that challenge um, and cover, cover these issues, but in a way that also intervenes specifically, strategically, and structurally in the exclusion of women's and LGBTI voices in media and public debates. So this year, one of the things that we've done um, uh, on, on this vein uh, is to launch a call for applications for two feminist investigative journalism fellows to work with us on this series, Tracking the Backlash, and receive mentoring, support, and ongoing training. 
and we received an astonishing 495 applications for two positions from all over the world. 495 applications for two positions. It's really incredible. And the, these, these applications came from South Sudan to Saudi Arabia, from Bogota to Brussels, um, and really demonstrated a level of commitment, skill, um, and passion that, you know, as journalists, it's very, very rare to see, to be honest. Um, and it's heartbreaking that we can only accept two of these candidates. So we on 50-50, but also I think in general in the media, we need to do better and we need to do more um, to build the capacity and confidence of women and trans writers um, to investigate issues that impact them. And this is a priority and a very core part of what we do, as is collaboration. So capacity building and collaboration are not sort of add-ons for us. They are like integral to you know, what we are trying to do. Um, and we are keen to work with anyone who shares these goals and a commitment to challenging threats to our rights in support of feminist women's rights and gender justice movements everywhere. And so Claire, why do you think this hasn't been happening so far? Um, so this is something that you and I have talked about a lot. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons that I wanted to mention quickly. And one of them is about the structure of newsrooms and the structure of media organizations that are, you know, and this is no surprise, um, are often, you know, very male dominated, particularly when you look at who holds power in these spaces, um, you know, who the senior editors are, who the commissioners are, um, when you look at job titles and responsibilities and um, the freedom that individuals have within newsrooms to pursue things that interest them rather than what they're assigned. Um, and in the, in the US, there was this one really striking study uh, from the Women's Media Center, which is a nonprofit that tracks issues like this, um, that has looked at when reproductive rights issues, for example, are covered in the media, when they're covered, um, it's more often by men. Um, and so uh, they produced a study in 2016 that looked at 12 major outlets in the US um, and found, for example, that at the New York Times, men authored nearly twice as many reproductive rights stories as women did. Twice, nearly twice as many. Um, and that men were also quoted more often in these stories. So they were not just writing these stories, but also those, it was still men's voices that are giving their opinions and thoughts on reproductive rights. Um, and if the exclusion of women's voices in debates around, around our rights is part of the problem, then why do we accept this? Um, I personally am, a, you know, I'm quite exhausted covering, this, covering these issues myself by reading piece after piece uh, by men, quoting men, telling me what to think about abortion, um, telling me what I should do with my body and what I shouldn't, telling me how I should act and how I shouldn't. Um, uh, and Laura and I were, were talking earlier today about is this effectively mansplaining on a really extraordinary scale? And if so, why do we accept it? Um, because who speaks and who frames issues in public debates, it really does matter. Um, and in addition to this, our, our very male-dominated newsrooms are often filled with a really ultra-competitive atmosphere that kicks questions like this to the curb in the race for my byline, my story, my moment, my recognition, my career, my promotion, <coughs> always about the individual. And this doesn't encourage collaboration or mentorship or solidarity between reporters. And it can also reproduce and, and really fail to challenge extremely disempowering and damaging power dynamics. And this isn't to say that all women are feminists, they're not, and it's not to say that doing this work is easy, it really isn't. Um, as an editor, it can be easier, it can be faster to work with a highly educated, in a traditional sense, highly experienced in a traditional sense, a native English speaking man based in the same time zone as you who doesn't ask these difficult questions, who doesn't ask your, their editor, am I really the right person to write this story? Maybe you should give it to someone else. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that the status quo is right or that we should continue um, to abide by or to support that status quo. Uh, meaningful collaborations, working in solidarity with other women, supporting new writers, challenging corporate power, challenging fascisms, fundamentalisms, investigating structural violence. This is also really difficult and delicate work, um, which is, I think, another reason why uh, you know, mainstream organizations in particular might not choose to focus their, their time on, on the, these areas. 
Um, because what we've seen on 5050 is, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time with our writers. We spend a lot of time getting to know them, working with them, developing relationships, editing their pieces really carefully, explaining our edits, engaging in a back and forth that most news desks and editors wouldn't dream of. It would seem like really inefficient. But our goals are, are different. Our goals are you know, also very explicitly about challenging the exclusion of women's voices, of trans women, of women of color, politically radical women, working class women, challenging the exclusion of their voices from media and public debates. This is really core to what we want to do. Um, but of course it requires significant care, time, and resources. Um, so our big, I just want to ask you about our big investigative project, Tracking the Backlash. Can you talk us through a few of those examples of kind of your highlights to demonstrate how, you know, this feminist investigative journalism actually works? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Tracking the Backlash series is one of the most exciting things I think we've been working on on 5050. And it's a really good example of how, um, I, you know, our own readership and the quality of our content, the strength of our work, um, has really grown significantly, but at the same time, we face a really serious mismatch between those successes on one side and really extremely limited resources on the other. Um, uh, so last year, this, this series you know, kind of started in, in essence last year after um, I went to uh, Budapest in Hungary to go and report from inside the 2017 summit of the World Congress of Families. Um, which is a global coalition of ultra-conservative, anti-abortion, anti-LGBT equality organizations that facilitates international link linkages between these groups. Um, and this summit in Budapest was like very similar to this festival. There were lots and lots of different workshops and talks and events. Um, but the focus there was on, on everything from how to use social media to win people over to really extreme anti-abortion positions, um, to how to how to use the, how to use television and media programs as part of a spiritual war for the so-called traditional family, defined really exclusively as a married man and a, and woman and their ideally many 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 children, um, and that that summit was really eye-opening um, in in terms of getting to see on the ground you know first person just how organized and coordinated this movement and internationalized this movement is. And since then we've published um, a number of really, I think, exciting in-depth and investigative articles including on the global expansion of a US Christian conservative legal army supporting court cases against abortion and LGBT equality around the world. Lara wrote a fantastic piece about the resurrection of a, a militant anti-abortion group called the Army of God in the US, which has been emboldened by the Trump administration. Claudia wrote a really in-depth piece on the impact on women's reproductive rights of conscientious objection exemptions for anti-abortion medical staff in Italy. Um, another of Lara's pieces that uh, was really particularly, I think, insightful um, and really ahead of, the, ahead of the game in terms of this kind of coverage, looked at the rise of the right-wing Spanish campaigning platform Citizen Go, which organizes mass online petitions, much like change.org, but also offline actions against sexual rights around the world. Um, we also published a series of dispatches, and we will continue to do so. Um, for example, from a trans teenager in Northern Ireland where bigotry is taught at school, from a black feminist activist in New York on how anti-abortion extremists in the US are even exploiting Black Lives Matter to vilify African American women. And we're really committed to continuing this series, to strengthening this kind of you know, very in-depth um, investigative journalism on feminist issues. And we really look forward to talking to all of you about this. We'd love it, um, you know, if more would, if we could collaborate with others. Um, we'd love for you to all join us on this uh, on this project, and for you to follow us on Twitter. Um, our handles are all up there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And um, so Rebecca Omanera Oyukanme is an independent investigative reporter and the editor of Shine a Light which is Open Democracy's UK investigative section. So Rebecca, I wanted you to talk us through how Shine a Light covers state and structural violence against women. Okay, thank you. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, great, because I've got quite a quiet voice, so if I trail off at any point, please say. Um, so first, I'll talk a little bit about how. 
Um, Shine a Light is a very small, um, feisty, investigative uh, storytelling project based in the UK. We published first on opendemocracy.net. Um, so at Shine, our focus tends to be on neglected story areas where we dig for evidence of state and corporate harm and wrongdoing. By corporate, we mean the private sector, so um, that's private companies delivering public services. And by state, we mean government policy, government a um, agencies or government actors um, who have power over other people's lives. And the specific areas that we report on um, include immigration detention and removal. We also look at prisons, especially children within the prison system. Um, we look at government cuts to legal aid, the outsourcing of public services to private companies, the impact of British austerity, austerity policies on um, women, black and brown people, families moving in and out of poverty. Um, we also look at avoidable deaths in state care, inequalities within the mental health sector, deaths in police custody, um, we're currently working on a story about a young man who died um, where I live in East London last summer after he was restrained and held down by a police officer and member of the public. So I would say that a commitment to rigorous research is a real priority for Shine a Light. Any comment or opinion that we publish tends to be reported and investigative in nature. So um, just tackling the how of your question, Lara, we work in quite an unorthodox way so underpinning our work is a real commitment to comradeship, um, collaboration, and respect um, with the people that we're editing and that we're commissioning, but also, most importantly for us, the communities affected by the issues that we write about. So we often work in partnerships with people who aren't professional writers. So that's families, activists, medical experts, lawyers, people who are really close to whatever injustice that we're covering. And we work together to tell a particular story over time and keep the issue alive, perhaps when the mainstream news agenda has moved on. And we lend our professional skills as journalists, so that's the rigor, the fact-checking, the editing, to produce compelling, readable articles on matters of the public interest. So it means that in future and um, for months and years ahead, our work can be a resource for activists, families who've experienced some sort of injustice. It's a reliable archive that can be used again and again. And I feel like it's really important to be embedded in community in this way. So to c collaborate where we can with people and take advantage of the flexibility of being independent journalists working for very small organizations. And this means that the stories we tell and our investigations can be done from the bottom up. Um, our sources tend to be based in communities and actually living through an injustice rather than people with access to money and power who might blow the whistle on something. Um, so specifically, um, we cover structural violence against women where it's related to the British government's austerity program. So that was uh, a program that begun, uh, began in 2008 in response to the financial crisis and has continued since then. And by austerity, what I mean is cutting the role of sta the state in society. So that's reduced spending on public services like social security, which we call welfare benefits in the UK. That's less money for local authorities, that's cuts to legal aid for people who aren't rich, and that's a freeze on the salaries of public sector workers. It's also lowering taxes, saving money by cutting spending. And all of this hurts women most. That's really well documented. I, there's a ton of statistics, I won't go through them now. Um, and just broadly, the reason women are most affected by these austerity programs is because they're more likely to use public services, they're more likely to be in low-paid jobs in the public sector, and they're more likely to do unpaid care work when the government is no longer providing a particular social service. And all these policy choices are very deliberate. It was a deliberate decision to enact austerity <coughs> despite knowing the fact that it would uh, cripple women financially in this way. Um, impacts assessments were produced and, and sent to civil servants and they still went ahead with the policy. And some of these policies, touching on what Claire just said, seem to be a deliberate attempt to create an old-fashioned nuclear family where women are forced into financially dependent relationships in order to survive. So as you can imagine, there's a huge swathe of material to investigate. 
you've got public services that have been built over decades, usually um, by feminist activists over time that have become state services, and they're being rolled back through this policy. And one area that I've tended to focus on is the lives of black and brown women and working class women, because we have data to show that they lose even more than the poorest white women, so they're really hit by some of these um, policies, and they're also dealing with existing structural um, disadvantages. So how does this play out in my work? So in the long history of the battle for wom women's rights and civil rights, and I include trans women in that, in that struggle, personal testimony and women talking and being listened to has been crucial in forcing a public awakening that precipitates activism, protest, legal change, and policy change. But in the world of investigative journalism, it's, it's very masculine. So there are certain stories that are deemed worthier than others. Um, and the voices of women just aren't seen as a priority. So in my reporting, I deliberately listen in a particular way, especially when I'm with women of color, groups often invisible to wider society in policy and politics and feminism. There are so many stories to inv investigate. The violence is pervasive and it's hidden in plain sight. So one story I worked on was in collaboration with journalists in Scotland and Northern Ireland to tell the story of refugee women and women with uncertain migration status trying to leave uh, violent relationships. And as I was investigating this story, I was reminded of a comment made by um, the woman, uh, a British woman in the UK who set up the first formal domestic violence shelter. Um, this was in 1972. Um, and she set it up in an abandoned house in West London. And she said at the time, one of the reasons why she set this place up was nobody seemed to be doing anything constructive to help. They just seemed to be sending these women back to the men who beat them and some back to be killed. <coughs> and she described a terrible, relentless, uncaring. And that was, well, that is exactly what is happening to refugee and migrant women across the UK today. Something that feminists fought for back in the 70s had started to succeed in getting um, an infrastructure of domestic violence services to support women. And there's this huge gap and there's this group of women who aren't being helped. So I wrote about um, a smart young woman named Nabila um, who had come to the UK from Pakistan and she married a British man. Um, her migration status was a bit um, iffy. She didn't have complete rights because she was there in the UK on a spousal visa. He was physically abusive, his family bullied her, and one day she just decided that she'd had enough. So she went to the British police, and instead of um, supporting her and treating her as a victim of crime, they interrogated her. When she went to a domestic violence refuge, they asked, what's your immigration status, before asking, or before even saying, I believe you. They couldn't help because her migration status meant that they wouldn't get government money to fund her place in the shelter. I won't go into detail about the policy, but there's a gap in the law, basically. Um, and it means that some migrant and refugee women in the UK um, who are there on a spousal visa can't access certain public services. Um, so just as an example, another woman that I interviewed said that her partner, after he hit her, would say, um, if you report me, I'll call immigration. They're going to believe me and not you. And that's exactly what happened. He was right. But Nabila managed to somehow get out of this situation, leave her abusive husband, but she had nowhere to go. So what happens next? Eventually, she was put in touch with an amazing lawyer. Um, she's also a woman of color, um, a legal aid lawyer, struggling to keep her practice going because the government also cut legal aid for immigration as part of its austerity program. So a lot of the work that this lawyer does for these women is not paid for. She's got to subsidize it with other work and there's only so many hours in, um, in the day for her to do all this. But eventually, Nabila managed to get legal, legal help through this lady. She secured a place at a, a special refuge for women of South Asian origin. Again, funding for these refuges has been cut dramatically by the government as part of their austerity program. So one of the first things to go was specialist refuges for women who had um, special needs. So services for black women, services for Latinx women, services for Muslim women, services for LGBTQ people, 
all of those were cut and the government was awarding contracts to um, big companies delivering generic services. So as part of my research, as well as interviewing women, one thing that I tried to do was get data from the government to support some of this. I sent freedom of information requests to the Home Office. They manage immigration. Their response was that they don't keep the data on domestic violence victims. I also sent requests to 34 local authorities across England and Wales. Um, and they're part of a network who are already monitoring um, migrants with precarious um, immigration status. And not one single data had, and not one single council had kept any data on these women. Um, a lot of them said, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll just like, quickly wrap up. But basically, the point I'm trying to make there is one of the problems that um, I have as someone who's trying to track what happens to women who aren't white or who have uncertain migration status is that sometimes the data isn't collected. Um, in another quick example, I worked with a university researcher on this. She was writing a story for me about the cuts to um, services for South Asian women and other women of colour in her area. And she found statistics on gender, statistics on race, but never statistics on both. And it made her feel invisible and frustrated. Um, so I think that's one ripe area for feminist investigative, um, investigative journalists to look into. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, just to move on to Krina. Um, Krina is a freelance data-driven investigative reporter based in London, but from Romania. So I wanted you to start by telling us how you started looking into gender-related stories as a data journalist. Hello, everyone. Um, I will read because I'm a bit nervous. This is being podcast, and I've never been on a feminist panel before. That's because... <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's because I'm pretty much of a data-driven journalist who doesn't look for a particular angle, but freelancers must find the underreported stories for a living. And I report on drivers of injustice, and so I chase dodgy people, questionable business interests, and harmful policies. Um, to get a comprehensive understanding, I usually start with data analysis. When reporting on vulnerable groups, it is impossible not to find examples where women suffer the most the brunt of inequality, and they usually top the pile. I should say at this point that um, the case studies I will talk about were not 50-50 assignments. They were freelance assignments for some other clients. I reported on compensation policies implemented by the British Ministry of Defence, MOD, for victims in war-torn Afghanistan. A table I obtained via Freedom of Information laid out the sums ministry paid out for each type of injury, partial blindness, a thousand bucks, loss of foot, $2,500, loss of both legs between $2,500 and $7,000, etc. Not even pounds. In combination with a database showing details of real cases they dealt with, I found that women victims were compensated by default and design significantly less than men for the same type of injury. For example, if a man was accidentally killed by the British Armed Forces, his family would be compensated with anything between eight to $1,200, to $1, um, yes, $1,000, apologize. Yeah, if a woman was killed, her family would be paid between five to $8,000. Um, and so on for pretty much every single type of injury, apart from one. Facially disfigured women were compensated with more money than facially disfigured men because it affected their pro uh, prospects of a good marriage, if any. Asked why they made this stark discrimination between sexes, the Defence Ministry in Britain said they were applying local customary laws, not the qualitarian human rights we heard so much of, the kind of laws that the British soldiers, at least in theory, enjoyed. Case two. I conducted two international polls on women's rights in a small team of two. One examined in endemic sexual harassment and violence on public transport in the world's mega cities. We've interviewed over 6,600 women in 16 metropolises. Parisian women interviewees felt that no one would help them if they were attacked in a metro station or on a train at night. 
women felt safer to travel in gender segregated coaches or carriages in Latin America, while in India they reported being targeted even more for using women's only transport vehicles. The most sho shocking aspect of this research to me was to find out that women around the globe chose their lives and not livelihoods not around their aspirations, dreams, or ambitions, but say, on how long they would have to walk on a street with no public lightning, one seemingly banal aspect of our everyday Western life. And this is just one example that would also affect their own children. Case three, a look at outward migration patterns in Romania's most underprivileged areas shows that children left home suffer when mothers are the first in a couple to migrate for seasonal work. Due to language similarities, Romanian women prefer to migrate to Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Their departure, forced by economic circumstances, had led to children going through emotional trauma, burnout phases, spike in child sexual abuse, especially in girls, and divorces. The migrating mothers are abused too. Their physical and mental health, self-esteem, and civil rights suffer as they toll abroad, often um, in abject conditions. Strawberry farmers are discouraged from bringing their husbands, but they are strongly encouraged to bring another woman from their village. These women feel less lonely when they share um, uh, tough, debilitating migration experiences with a cousin, sister, or friend. They cry side by side over the phone when hearing the strange voice of their children on Mother's Day. These women have become the main breadwinners of their family. Underprivileged Romanian villages are experiencing a poverty-induced matriarchate revival. Those few families that have adapted to this new reality have done so with an implicit level of pain, but their families have become stronger. Case four. Reporting on women's rights in the MENA region in 2013, we surveyed both grassroots and international experts. We've interviewed them and transformed their answers into measurable data and came up with a rank. We discovered that women's rights activists from the MENA region and other Arab countries who work assiduously to achieve gender equality thought that women's freedom to enjoy sex, education, access to finance, or simply self-determined life rolled back most ironically in Arab Spring countries. These are all cases that I found just by looking at data. Thank you. Um, thank you. And so what is then the specific value <laughs> of, of looking at, uh, into the data on gender and gender issues? If you could talk us through that. Yes, I love this question. Thank you, Lara. <laughs> um, issues like these ones um, are reported, are rep on, well, issues like these ones spring to pen and ink and paper. If we can move from an anecdote to finding out how widespread a problem is, how large the scale, how serious, if any changes occurred over a period of time, if any changes occurred over the period of a political regime, for example. Finding data sets, scraping and cleaning, knowing whether they are relevant or enough, knowing how to analyze and interpret results, how to report them out using a few num as few numbers as possible. It is the realm of data-driven investigations. Um, they have the power of showing if a wrongdoing is systematic, whether it is scientifically correlated with another aspect of life or politics, who the outliers are very quickly, the winners, the losers, the anomalies. These are not randomly picked examples um, the color that you will be using are based on evidence. This is evidence-driven journalism. Um, when you go about your reporting using a data-driven approach, there is a certain integrity in your findings. Sometimes you must write your stories around extreme cases. Sometimes the average is the biggest anomaly you'll ever find. Um, business and political stakeholders, or whoever you have to hold to account, will think sometimes twice before accusing you that you come from a propagandistic or malicious place. Evidence-based reporting, rather than anecdotal, shelters both journalists and their sources, to some degree, from iteration. It's sometimes better to protect vulnerable sources when you have a database that's an inanimate object, you can't kill it. 
Women's voices um, and needs continue to be underrepresented. When you show serious discrepancies between, let's say, the number of publicly funded health projects that address women's needs versus men's needs, you already have the evidence, you don't speak in general. Most of the times with data, you don't assume, you know. Thank you, Thank you. Nina. And, and then finally, I want to introduce um, Claudia Torisi, who is one of our columnists at 5050 and our star. And I wanted you, you've written for us about how the Italian media covers violence against women. So I wanted to start by asking you about that piece. Hello, everyone. I am Italian, as you can easily guess <laughs> from my accent. Um, I think that violence against women is one of the best examples of why Italy needs um, real feminist journalism. In Italy, the mainstream media talks a lot about stories of femicides, women killed or abused by their partners, raped by strangers, and newspapers and TV programs are full of these kind of stories. The problem is that telling stories about women is not the same thing as telling women's, women's rights story. And too often the, the caution and the care that should be applied to reporting on uh, such a critical issue is absent. Um, Italian media use, uh, too often use a sort of romantic frame to talk about these stories. The, the murder is often presented as a crime of passion. You can read words like um, sick love, jealousy. It, it's, it, this is really unbelievable how widespread this uh, narrative is. If you do a quick search on Google um, with the words in Italian, killed for jealousy, uccisa per gelosia, you will see an incredible number of results. Um, an example, last month in, uh, in Sicily, a um, 20 years old girl was stabbed to death by her boyfriend and there were plenty of articles and headlines saying that he killed her for jealousy. Almost all the news coverage of this case talked about jealousy. Um, but if you dig a little into, into this story, you find that the relationship between that girl and her boyfriend was far from being perfect and healthy. She had been beaten up by her partner several times, but she had never filed a complaint to the police. So I think that that is why this narrative full of stereotypes and this romantic frame is dangerous, because describing violence as linked to um, individual responsibilities leaves out from the story the, the roots of the violence which are patriarchy, unequal power relation between men and women, discrimination, and so on. And most important, it doesn't help to raise awareness on this problem, on the problem of violence against women. There are a lot of issues related to femicides and violence that need to be investigate, investigated. For example, a lot of victims had filed complaints to the police before being killed. So the question is, why are Italian laws and authorities failing to protect women from violence? Or why women's centers and um, refuge have so many uh, difficulties in carrying out their activities? Why are many of them about to close? Or another example, why is Italy unable to set school education programs to prevent violence? So these are the issues that should be addressed when telling stories of women who are murdered, abused, raped by men. Something is changing now, um, thanks to a groups, of, to groups of female journalists and researchers who are trying to reconstruct the way we talk about violence against women in Italy. Um, there are initiatives, education courses, protests when there is a bad coverage, but still this narrative um, is predominant, so we definitely need better reporting on violence against women. 
Thank you. And so you gave us one of our biggest hits on 5050 when you looked into the Weinstein scandal and how the um, Italian media were reporting it. So do you want to tell me about that? And what was different about how it was being reported in Italy compared to other countries? Yeah, one of the Weinstein's accus accusers was the Italian actress and director Asi Argento, who told The New Yorker she has been sexually assaulted by Weinstein in 1997. So that's the reason why Italian media gave significant space to the, to the scandal. But instead of focusing on Weinstein, they scrutinized the victims. We can definitely say that in Italy, Weinstein scandal quickly became as the Argento scandal. Media, <laughs> media uh, reports focused on her behavior, describing her as a, an opportunist, even a prostitute, questioning why she had waited so long to, came fo to come forward. Um, some, rep um, some reports said that what she was claiming was not even violence as she was not beaten, she did not scream, she did not escape, she, didn't, she did not fit the stereotype of a sexual violence victim. What is worse is that such voices here are perceived as common sense. She could have done something to avoid that situation and this is a phrase that you, is really common in Italy when talking about sexual violence. And this is how a victim of sexual assault is, is treated here every time. The debate here got stuck in show business and was treated by media, by media as gossip. This is really different from what happened, for example, in the US, uh, where a lot of powerful men lost their jobs. Uh, or in the UK, where the scandals affected politics too. It seems that industries all over the world had their own moments of reckoning inspired by Weinstein scandal, while the, we did not uh, have any. And here the discussion around sexual harassment at work remain a sort of taboo. I think that journalism played a big role in this different. Um, newspapers and TV programs in Italy showed no courage at all talking about the implication of Weinstein case. This is, of course, a cultural problem, and it, sh it shows how much sexual abusers and harassers can feel safe in this country. But this also has to do with the Italian media industry, which is a word in in which the power is all in male hands. There are a lot of female journalists, but very few of them have position of power in our newsrooms. And so the real problem is that narratives are shaped by men who are in power, and we know that harassment is about power. Of course, Italy has an harassment problem at work. i show you some data. Our National Institute of Statistics estimated that 8.2 million Italian women between 14 and 65 years old have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. 1.4 million women have experienced physical harassment or sexual blackmail in their workplace. What is more is that 80% of women affected said that um, they had told no one at work about the incident, and almost no one, it's uh, the 99%, had reported the incident to the police. So we need feminist investigative journal journalists to uncover this system of harassment and abuse in every working field, including media, and to tell these underreported stories to create a um, safer, safer space for women to share their experiences. Thank you. And so, just so we did a series on women in the far right in January about the slightly complicated role that they often play there. And so, I just wanted to quickly ask you about your story on Casa Pound. Yeah. 
My piece was, as you said, about the rising role of women in the Italian far-right movement, Casa Pound. I started working on this story because last November, the Italian edition of the women's magazine, Marie Claire, published an article entitled, Do You Know Who Casa Pound's Women Are? And there were five female militants of Casa Pound interviewed about uh, their private lives, what they like to wear, mm, how they manage their social and family lives, this kind of, of stuff. And the, the article seemed to say that you can be a woman and be a Casa Pound militant at the same time. It was propaganda, of course. But this focus on women was something new, especially for a fascist movement that is very more chauvinist. Um, in the same month of Mary Claire's article, um, there was a local election in um, the Roman suburb of Ostia. And Casa Pound local spokeswoman, uh, woman, Carlotta Chiara Luce, gained a lot of attention from um, the media. There were articles on uh, how, beauty sh how beautiful she was, how she was a dedicated mother, an athlete, a, a singer. So I tried to understand why Casa Pound was so concerned about promoting its women all of a sudden. Um, I spoke with, with researchers and we studied the far right, far right movements in general and Casa Pound in particular. And they told me that it's not new that far-right movements in Europe are trying to um, give more visibility to female personalities in order to reach a broader audience and, of course, gain female votes. And the role of female leader is to soften the image of this movement in opposition with the violence associated with male militants, but still the racist and fascist message remain, remain the same. This is happening in Italy while the media is giving significant space to far-right movements. Its members are invited on TV talk shows on a daily basis, but their violent positions are basically never questioned. It is really common for far-right movement to use in some way a female figure um, for their propaganda. It happens, for example, after every rape or violent episode perpetrated by a migrant. Uh, in those occasions, far-right movements claim to care, to care for women, but they, in fact, use these cases for their anti-immigration propaganda, violent messages, and fascist policy proposals. It is important that journalists deconstruct this narrative and we need to understand what is at stake. I think that is uh, our rights, women's rights, and definitely our choices and our freedom. And so before I open it up to the audience for questions, um, I just wanted to ask all of you quickly, quick fire round, what feminist investigation have you not done yet that you want to do? Will we start with you, Claire? Yeah, so there, there are obviously many. One of them is um, uh, single mothers in the gig economy and gendered impacts of precarious work. Great, Rebecca? Um, I would say forced to pick one, um, sexual violence against trans women of colour. I'm going to answer as well. Um, mine would be on the increasing violence against um, abortion clinics across Europe. Karina? I will keep you hanging, won't divulge it, but what I would say is that I would like to see beats around certain issues around women and when fresh data comes out every month or every three months or every half a year, I'd like to see those stories repeating and monitoring the progress of the same issues through the findings in data. Ooh, intriguing. Claudia? Um, it could seem strange, but I, I think that a story that is underreported in Italy is the condition of female journalists, as they are paid less than they, their male colleagues. They face uh, harassments and they don't reach top position in uh, our newsrooms. Great, so we have went over just a little bit, but we still have plenty of time for questions. So um, 
raise your hands and we'll get you a mic. And then if you want to just say who the question's for, or maybe a few people can answer if they want. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Conantehulu. I'm a freelance journalist from the UK. And this is a question for the panel as a whole. Um, I was wondering if you see your work as activism as well as journalism and where you would draw the line between, between journalism and activism. Um, well, I can answer that one. Because <laughs> I've just done an article this week on the I Believe Her protests, which is, um, for those of you who don't know, there's been a very gruesome rape trial that went on in Belfast against some rugby players and they were all acquitted and I was part of a crowdfunding campaign to raise money to put an advert to call for the players in question to be dropped and then I was reporting on it so it's these kind of two hats that we I wear quite often and but at the same time I had to kind of criticize myself in the piece and speak to a lot of men's rights activists in order to have some kind of balance and I had to be very upfront with the reader about that as in like I had to have it quite high up so that the reader knew my position from the start because we are unashamedly feminist and we don't apologize for it and you know our readers know that and they kind of love us for it we have huge times on pages spent um so it's it's kind of a a balance between the two but we kind of ex for me I express my activism normally through my journalism but I try not to get too involved in the story all the time. Does anybody else want to? Um, yeah, I would say um, I try and keep them separate. So um, I kind of have been in activist spaces, but I don't, um, I'm not in those spaces as a journalist. So like my journalist hat's off. I can't report on anything that's going on in meetings and stuff. Um, whereas my journalism is very separate. I would say I'm very biased in my journalism because I choose to s focus on specific communities, but those are communities, I think, um, who are very underreported on. So that work isn't being done. So I feel, yeah, I guess maybe it's a political decision to choose to focus on that. Um, but I try and approach it very professionally because um, what, um, uh, what Karina was saying about trying to make sure your work stands up so it can't easily be dismantled by people who are opposed to what you're fighting for is really important. And one way I do that is to try and approach these stories as a journalist, so questioning people that I might agree with. And, yeah. Can I say something quickly to add to that? On 50-50, on you know, the, the, the journalism that we publish, the you know, feature reports, news reports, investigative stories, those are like very classic journalism products. Um, uh, what we do that is, I think, you know, quite like um, sort of an activist activity is the capacity building that we do with um, with women and trans writers, and that is that is like we're not ashamed to say that we absolutely prioritize the voices of those who are currently excluded in the media. If that means that we're activists, great, that's fine. You know, that's fine. Like we have chosen that we want to use this space to also structurally intervene in that kind of tackling that exclusion. I welcome your question because I put this across to my colleagues all the time, uh, no matter what subject, not just feminism. Um, and I do activism just around the freedom of information and government transparency. I think they should show everything there is to it, no matter what subject it covers, to the point that I have two lawsuits against the European Parliament for the decision not to share the um, MEP's general expenses. But I think my approach to the world through the data lens forces me to look at what's structural and spread. So in that sense, I check my biases, in, at least from the very beginning. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Uh, fabulous work, uh, amazingly, uh, very, very much needed. Can I ask you how you are measuring or planning to measure the impact of your work? Is this for, for who is the question? 50-50 or in, uh, yeah, the Tracking the Backlash series? Um, one of the things, I mean, we, we do a bit of uh, impact tracking the way any media organization would through analytics, so we definitely keep an eye on things like that, on page stats. One of the things that we're really proud of on 5050 is our average time spent on one of our articles is three minutes and 50 seconds, which is like a, a hugely far away from any kind of industry average, like a minute a page or 
45 seconds a page would be much more the norm in a mainstream publication. Um, so we're really proud of that, and, and, incre and that number's going up. So it was, it, you know, six months ago, it was three and a half minutes was our average time on page. Now, average time on page is around four minutes. For some articles, it's six minutes, which means that people are reading every single word. So we're really proud of that. That's a kind of level of engagement that we're, we're tracking and, um, and that we don't want to lose as we expand. Um, uh, another thing that we do do is when we do, we've done quite a few um, sort of very structured uh, capacity building trainings with women's rights organizations and, and new writers, and we do surveys at the beginning and at the end of those trainings to um, measure things, not just you know skills, but also levels of confidence in doing different types of journalism work. Um, and so we definitely try to track that through surveys. Um, but we are thinking all the time about how to measure impact. And you know, one of the things that we that's great about um, uh, open democracy, where a lot of us publish, is that we uh, publish on Creative Commons licenses. So it's free for other non-commercial publishers to republish. And that's also, I think, a really important area of our impact. And so we track republications and co-publications. Um, and translation. And translations. Uh, Works. Academic references. We're invited to talk on panels. Lara's on the radio all the time. <laughs> um, we're really proud of that. Um, but we're also, you know, really keen on any suggestions people have on how to track impact because it is a really complicated question. And um, and for funding, we, you know, we need funding, and, and that's a really good way to get funding. You know, so it's something that we're we and the kind of impact of. a lot of our journalism might be looking for is difficult to quantify. Yeah. Um, or, or like changing the conversation the way Claudia did with your Weinstein thing. You know, it got picked up and it was like this new part of a conversation. Like that's an impact that is, you know, very direct. But at the same time, how do you actually, you know, measure it? But no, tricky. Rebecca, <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. Sorry. On it? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so on um, impact on China Light, um, we often deliberately employ us. We know that our readership is low compared to The Guardian, say. So we have a deliberate strategy when we start out on a story that we try and share um, our stories ahead of publication with as many other outlets as possible. So one example um, is we worked with this housing activist who lives in the north of England, and he does a lot of work on asylum housing. So these are houses for asylum seekers in the UK, and they're run by G4S, a private um, security company. You might know because they run Guantanamo Bay contracts. They run prisons in South Africa. They're horrible. Um, so they run these houses really badly. Um, and John, Com he's not a professional journalist, but he's, um, he's got access to all this great material. So we spend a lot of time turning it into something that's readable and that can be used. Um, we've got a whole archive of articles from on, on this story, and they have been used, um, they've been picked up by other newspapers, they've, been, um, they've influenced stories in the New York Times, The Guardian, um, on the BBC, um, they've been quoted in um, Parliament in the UK, so there is that impact that we don't, I guess it's part of our collaborative working. We don't always have our name to everything, but it's really important for us that the story is out there because as soon as the others pick it up, that means there's more likely to be change and that's more important for us. On, from a freelancer perspective, maybe the question is a bit more difficult to answer, but um, on the Romanian mother's story, we had unions, I published in English, and we had unions in Romania asking us if we could translate that into Romania because they would like to use it in their push for better working conditions. Uh, on the poll on women's um, sexual harassment and violence on public transport, we had um, authorities in several countries saying we could do more, so this gives a tool to activists to use it, and, and so on. So if you have somebody reacting saying we have to do better, then that's a good measure of impact. Next question. Oh, over here. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, firstly, I wanted to say thank you as a feminist journalist who often finds journalistic spaces uh, really exclusionary, intimidating, and silencing because how, of how they're dominated by patriarchal ideals and masculinity. It was such a fresh breath of fresh air to hear about even the idea of feminist investigative journalism. And I suppose during this conference, I've been thinking a lot about how we can engage men in that concept and whether, and do we even need to, and who, and yeah, because on panels like this, and I've been to all the women's panels, I've been to one where there were no men in attendance, 
and mostly there aren't many men in attendance and it can be quite exhausting thinking perhaps do you even care and starting those conversations. That's a really good question and we have like slightly different views across the panel on this yes. so who wants to go yes. first? I would like to go first because okay. <laughs> I sort of specifically asked that we have at least one question for a male if possible during this Q&A. Maybe it's not possible but if a guy has a question that would be awesome. Thanks. We just don't hear from man enough in life, do we? I know, oh, so love to. And there's so many, several guys that are just around you. One, two, three, and I can see your brothers. <laughs> there are Thank friends you, guys. Um, I don't really care about men. <laughs> in, I mean, in, just in terms of this work, like unless they're willing to like give give me money or share their platform. <laughs> That I, yeah. Like, I don't know, my husband is so grateful when I pay for drinks. It's, um, it's like we're in an equal relationship when I also offer to pay. He's really happy about that. Okay, okay, I'll be serious. But really, I think what this is about is trying to redress a balance that um, an imbalance that exists. So um, by not having men here or not sort of focusing on what do men think or how should we involve them in that, that's kind of the rest of journalism for us. So we're just kind of trying to correct that balance and open up spaces for these stories that are, are important stories and they are being missed and all journalists should care about them, you know, as, as part of their kind of ethos of being journalists who expose wrongdoing, who hold powerful people accountable. Yeah, and I, I mean, I personally, I refuse to judge um, our success or 50-50 success on whether men are paying attention to us. Like, you know, um, we can force them to pay attention. But I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say that we're not successful if there aren't like 50% men in the room. I should, I, I will say though, you know, it's, it does surprise me, you know, but 45% of 50-50s readers are male, which is really interesting. Um, I, I'm not going to comment on whether or not I think that's a good thing or not, but I don't think it's a necessary thing, but it's the reality. <laughs> Great. Um, over here? Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is whether one possibility to compensate the imbalance is maybe to um, establish a women's quote in journalism positions or is it an ambition that should rather develop from the inside, if that makes sense. Sorry, a women's code within journalism? Okay, uh, who wants to go for that? Like a sisterhood? Claudia. Like a sisterhood? Um, Can you be more specific? I'm not clear on the question. Is it, maybe, maybe that's not the right word in English, but it's like basically, um, yeah, a quota, a wo woman's quota. Uh, okay. Do you understand? Quota. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, Claudia answer? Do you want that? I don't know. <laughs> I think that something definitely have to, has to change in the, the newsrooms. I can speak for Italy, of course, because I don't have a real knowledge of how it works in other countries. I think that maybe in UK or in US is different from here, but from what I saw here and what I keep seeing here, um, there, um, I think that one problem is the um, power Im imbalance uh, w between men and, and women in the, in, the, in the newsrooms and there is a problem in the system and, um, but there is another problem that is how, how our media industry works um, where a lot of journalists are precarious, including women, so maybe they are not pushed to um, stay together and fight together. I, I give you an example, maybe I, I will be <laughs> more, more clear. If, if, I, um, if you report um, that you've been uh, harassed by your editor, you can look for my solidarity 
and maybe I can't support you, but, but maybe you can lose your job, and maybe can I lose my job too, because I have no contract, or my contract is really weak, um, because uh, the editors prefer uh, male colleagues, uh, I can, cannot work anymore, even I, I, I will be not fired. So I think there is a problem of power, but in Italy it is also a structural problem of our media industry. I don't know if I answered to you, your question. So maybe the quota, it could be a solution, um, not permanent, because I think, but I think that it, it could be maybe a, a start, but then we need to work uh, on the structure of, of the industry. And by we, I mean men and women together. Um, Rebecca, did you, did you have a point? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think um, rather than quotas, um, newsrooms could just hire women, talented women, talented um, women of color, talented trans women. Um, I don't think it's more complicated than that. I think when people talk about diversity, they make it more complicated than it needs to be. At the moment, there's a quota system, and it's a quota system for men. They, they get most of the jobs. So I think um, it's just a bit of extra work to go out and find talent that is not in the usual places, so not in traditional places. Uh, in the UK, there's a problem with a lot of journalists going, um, who are privately educated, going to two universities, um, getting all the jobs. Uh, so that, that's an obvious, um, there's an obvious solution, just look beyond your, your networks and look for talent in other places. I think it could be quite easy. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure personally about quotas, but um, but I, I think that uh, publications that um, you know where you see the front page is always only men, it's always only white men. I think they should be embarrassed about that, and I think they should be held to account for that. That doesn't necessarily mean instituting quotas, but if every single story that's written about uh, you know politics in sub-Saharan Africa is written by a white man based in London, they should be embarrassed by that. You know, and and we can make that point over and over again, and that might be more effective in in getting editors and newsrooms to start asking that question all the time, who should be writing this story, um, that might be more effective than instituting a quota that can be very top down and um, you know, can get quite complicated because what do you do? You have you know, 50 different quotas, so you make sure that you have, you know, how, how would you do it? Because you, would you have a quota for trans women as well? Would you have a quota for people living with disabilities? Would you have a quota, you know, you'd have to think that through um, and maybe just, uh, you know, making sure that question, who should be writing this story, whose voices should be heard, maybe just forcing that into the conversation might be a more effective way of doing it. Um, and I just want to add, so, um, because it's what we always end up doing as women, a lot of us have started doing this work already. So we do a lot of mentoring. Um, I do a lot of workshops around um, the UK in very sort of disadvantaged areas, working with teenagers, um, workshop, writing workshops where we talk about social justice and politics, and for the first time they're asked their opinion and given an opportunity to write. Um, and these are people, yeah, they're great. The kids are amazing. They're super bright and, and intelligent, but a lot of them just don't, see journalism as a profession for them because they don't see people that look like them on the front pages of newspapers, editing newspapers. So what we try and do is just give them that confidence to write, help them enter competitions and things like that. It's not, it's not enough, but it, it's something, it's a start. So I know that those, those voices are out there. And one from me. Um, when it comes to quotas, I have the bad habit of believing in meritocracy rather than in gender parity. And I know that we have a debate among us how to deal with my bias around this. However, I would focus on women who leave journalism, the, the reasons why women would leave journalism. And I would share with you right now a very private anecdote that I've never shared with anyone publicly like this. I was 17. It was the first time I was in a newsroom. I wanted to become a journalist. And at the end of a large editorial meeting, the editor-in-chief walked by me and pinched my hip in front of everyone. Neither uh, the men nor the women said anything to him. And I was thinking maybe I shouldn't be in this environment if this is the way things go. I was almost ready to give it up. Um, and nobody helped me to go through. I went through it alone. And I think accountability 
is a way of dealing with things, with quotas and with meritocracy as well. And there has to be a system in place, even if the editor-in-chief is connected to the intelligence services. Um, the woman with the blonde hair. Hi, uh, Jasmine Anderson, Investigations at Pink News and a co-founder of Second Source. A uh, huge fan of your work, guys. It's absolutely Likewise. fantastic. Likewise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask with an LGBT hat on, even in a gay news agenda, getting lesbian or bi content or investigations into the limelight is a difficult slog, even in my remit. But what's even more difficult is sometimes with lesbian, bi, queer women, that data isn't there. So I wonder what you do when that data is not there. Try and find it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I've done some work with, um, I'm part of this, uh, there's a group in the UK, they're called the Women's Budget Group. They're a group of really um, smart feminist um, academics. A lot of them are economists. So um, one question that I asked, um, they, they've done a lot of um, work looking at um, finance policy and um, using the statistics that the government pol um, publishes to look at the impact on women. So I said, well, what, can you break down that data and look at the different types of women? So single, single parents, um, female pensioners, black women, uh, Muslim women, etc. So... They have just done a project working with some grassroots charities and um, working with some economists to ki come up with some data on how certain government policies are affecting those groups. So the work can be done, but you just need um, like the data experts and, and the sort of clever people that can do stuff with academics and, num and numbers <laughs> and stuff to be on your side and be interested in doing that research. And if you can form partnerships and collaborations that way, that way to do it. So, for example, the Women's Budget Group really should have done work on on LGBT stuff. So that's something I'm going to go back and raise with them. Um, I don't know what the answer is. To I could help out, perhaps. <laughs> My first job, real job as a data reporter, was leading an international research where there was no data about the subject we wanted to report on. Um, what we did was to design a questionnaire. Every single line of questionnaire is a column in your Excel spreadsheet or Google spreadsheet, whatever spreadsheet you want, InfoLibre spreadsheet, whatever you want, you design your ideal database. And if you have the means that you can involve the right people and you just le learn a bit how to ethically source the data, you go out and you run a poll. And you can get the insights we had into the rollback on women's rights in the MENA region or the women's, um, or the uh, endemic gender violence and harassment on public transport around the globe. There was no data, and we done it. Thanks for your question. Um, and then just finally, sometimes that can be a really good opportunity, because if there's no data, then nobody's done it before, you know, and you, you've got a really killer story there. Um, and we, we would be happy to work with you yeah. on a project. <laughs> Maybe the story is why there isn't any data about it. Um, any final question? I think we have to... Oh, no, no. Sorry. Oh, sorry. We're not leaving. We're here, so come, <laughs> come chat. Um, follow us. Come collaborate. Come meet us. You know, this is a network we want to build, and, and we want to do it with, with people like you. And most of us are here until Sunday. Yes, we are. So Or Monday. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you.